All right, good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Um, today we will be talking about graphing radicals. So in the kind of introduction into graphing radicals, uh, we're going to look back at some other graphs that we've done previously in the year. Now, I do want you to understand that we've been doing a lot with radicals, adding radicals, multiplying and uh, dividing radicals, square roots, cube roots, all this type of thing. Um, but when we get into this folk or when we get into this graphing of radicals, I want you to understand that we're only going to look at square roots right now because with cube roots and fourth roots, we could go on and on and on forever talking about all different forms of graphing. But today we just kind of want to take a basic introduction into how to graph a radical. So the first thing we have to do when we're considering graphing a radical is look back at what we've already done. So you can see here that I have the equation f of x equals um, this ax minus h squared plus k. And then we see it again, same exact format, f of x equals a x minus h plus k, but this time it has absolute values rather than a square. So I want you to take a second and think to yourself, do you remember when we graphed squares, when we graphed quadratics, what shape did a quadratic make? Then I want you to think about what shape did an absolute value make? And if you're not entirely sure, look around the room at the posters. There's a couple of posters with quadratics and there's a couple of posters with absolute values. The ones that were quadratic, this one up top here, took on the shape of more of like a U shape, if you recall. So we'd always kind of find that vertex and then we would find some points on both sides and graph that. With the absolute values, we would do the same thing. We'd find that vertex and then we would find some points on the left, find some points on the Y, or sorry, on the right, and it would make this V shape. But each time you should notice that we had the H inside and the K outside. And we had this saying that it was always the opposite of what's inside and the same as what's outside. And that would help us find this vertex. So what we're going to be doing in this unit is actually the exact same thing, but this time instead of having it squared or having an absolute value, now what we have is a square root. So you will notice that we still have the H and we still have the K. So using our power of deduction based on these previous graphs in vertex form, this is also in vertex form. So what we look at here, and you can kind of ignore this example, that was something else. Um, but if we look at this example here, we have the H and the K. So if I were to ask you, what's my vertex? You would say my vertex is the H comma K. Again, that would be like our X and our Y point, H, H comma K. The X and the Y in the rest of the equation are just all the other points on the graph. So if you go back to, you know, when we were doing the parabola, there's thousands of points along this side and thousands of points on the other side, but that point right there was the critical point and that was our vertex, okay? So when we find that H and K, it's just simply our vertex, but the, all the other points in the graph come from that X and the Y on the other side. So just like when we did this unit, the first thing we must do is graph the parent graph. So here's the parent graph, and basically what a parent graph is, is an equation that doesn't have an H and doesn't have a K. It's very, very neutral. If you're wondering why we haven't talked about the A at all, is because a lot of the times the A determines the shape of the graph. Like, am I drawing it kind of this U shape, or is it going to be thinner, or is it going to be fatter? That's what the A usually does. So a lot of the times we don't really worry about A other than when we're trying to calculate points. So back to our parent graph. If I look at this parent graph and I say, well, what's the H and what's the K? There is no H, therefore my vertex, I'm gonna put a little V for vertex. My vertex is gonna be a zero because I don't have an H. And as far as what's being added on the outside, still nothing, so I'm at zero, zero. So we come over to our graph and we put a point at 0, 0. Then, just like any other, uh, any other graph that we've done before, we would start plugging in points. So I could kind of make maybe like a table over here. Let's come over here and make a table. And we would pick some points. Now I want you to consider something. If I plug in a 1, 
the square root of 1, if you look over at your little half sheet of paper, is 1. But if I do the square root of 2, we end up getting this really ugly decimal. So frequently, we would just leave it as the square root of 2. But that's not really something that we can graph. So when picking points, be very conscious of the fact that we're square rooting something. So 1 square rooted is 1. 2 doesn't work. 3 doesn't work. What about 4? Well, the square root of 4 is 2. So you can kind of see pick perfect numbers, numbers that will actually work out under that square root. Otherwise, you're going to end up with decimals, and those can be really challenging to graph. So let's go through and do our 1, 1. And then we do 4, and we square rooted it, and we got 2. We could think to ourselves, uh, what about 9, right? The square root of 9 is going to be 3. And therefore, we start taking on this shape. Okay. Now, you might think to yourself, well, what about negative numbers? So let's consider for a second that I come over, go back to my x and y table, and let's try some negative numbers. If I plug in a negative 1, that's going to give me the square root of negative 1. And I'm just plugging it in right here, plugging it in for the x value. So the problem with that is I have the square root of a negative number, which to us means that it's imaginary. But you can't really graph imaginary on a table like this. Imaginary is like a whole other dimension. Therefore, when I start going past this vertex, there exists nothing other than imaginary numbers. But as far as graphing goes, we can't do that. And no matter what negative number I try, even negative 4, it's still going to be the square root of negative 4, which is imaginary. So actually, this kind of half shape is our parent graph. So every graph that we do from this point on is going to take this kind of arch type of turn. So we want to come down and consider something that we've looked at before, this idea of transformations. So I want to bring you back to the idea of uh, quadratics. So when we had something squared, or over here something squared, or you know here's my x squared, x squared, now, going back up to the idea from the top, the h and the k were always our vertex. So we could look at this and hopefully say, oh, I know that my vertex is going to be the opposite of what's inside and the same as whatever's behind, which means my vertex is at negative 2, 0. Then I could do it for the next one and say opposite of what's inside, that's a positive 2, same as what's outside, 0. And then the next one, I would say, OK, well, there is nothing inside, so my h would be 0. But there is a positive 2 on the outside, so I make that positive 2. Then the next one, I could do the same thing and get myself 0 and negative 2. But what this is really talking about over here is when I'm thinking of those vertexes, which way am I actually shifting? So what I have here is a little image for you guys. And let me kind of bring it in a little bit closer so that you can consider what's happening here. So you can see here that we have this kind of standard equation. Here's the parentheses being squared, and it's technically a plus 0, although you cannot see it. Trust me, it is a 0. And we have this kind of U shape that we would expect. If I start to change one of these variables, you'll notice that it starts going up. That's because I'm changing this outside value that unfortunately is cropped off right now to a 3. So my graph moved up 3. So if I change the number on the outside, it moves it up. If I change that number on the outside to a negative number, like a negative 3.5, we see that it's going down. Now let's return that graph to 0, 0. So I'm going to move that back up. So we figured out that that outside number, if it's positive, it goes up. If it's negative, it goes down. So let's come back over here. If it's positive, I'm going to go up. And if it's negative, it's going to go down. That's referring to that outside number. I can do the same thing with the inside number. So if I take that inside number right here, see, watch that 0. And let's say that I take it to the uh, positive number. So let's see, I'm looking at positive 10. But how weird it moved in the negative direction. But if you recall, that's because we always say opposite of what's inside. So although my number is positive 10, I moved in the negative direction. 
So if I look at something that's positive on the inside, which direction did it move? It moved left. So if it's positive on the inside, it's going to move left, which makes sense because I'm over here with my negative numbers. Now I could come back to here and say, well, what if I took that neg or that number inside and made it negative? See how it's a negative 10 now? Yet I moved right. So if that inside number is negative, then I move right. Here's an inside number that's negative, so I move right. Now again, that should all be a review, but how does that relate us to our quadratics? So here's how it relates to our quadratics. It's all exactly the same. So we're still going to be talking about if the function's positive inside, we move left. If it's negative, right. If it's positive on the outside, we go up. Negative on the outside, we go down. It's all exactly the same. The only thing that's going to change is instead of having a U shape, I'm now going to have that kind of arch shape. So if I consider this one, my vertex would probably be the opposite of what's inside, same as what's outside. Therefore, I moved left. I could do it again with the next one. Opposite of what's inside, same as what's outside, I moved right. Next one, I have a 3 on the outside but nothing on the inside. So my vertex is going to be 0, 3. That means that I went up. And the last one, I have nothing on the inside, so that's a 0. And a negative 3 on the outside, that's a negative 3 for my y. Therefore, I went down. So all the rules are exactly the same. And that's why I come back to this idea. It's all the same stuff. And the sooner you get the hang of this idea of H and K, the sooner that you will be able to master all forms of graphing. I could give you a quadratic. Boom, you know the vertex. I could give you an absolute value. Boom, you know the vertex. And now I could give you a quadratic. Or said that wrong, sorry. Now I could give you a radical and boom, you know the vertex. So all of them, H, K, H, K, H, K, anytime you see that H and K, that is your vertex. The tricky part is remembering that it's always the opposite of what's inside. Whatever's inside, we want to do the opposite of it. So we're going to come down and consider some different graphs. Let me zoom out a little bit better. Give me just a second. There we go, we can see that nice and clear. So we're going to consider two graphs here. We're going to consider this g of x, which I'm going to do in navy blue, and then h of x, which I'm going to do in teal. Okay, I'm going to keep them in different colors because they are completely unrelated graphs. It's just that matter of, you know, telling the two apart. In saving space, I did them all on one graph. So we look at our g of x, and the first thing we should always do is identify where is my vertex going to be. What are my h and my k? So my h would be whatever's on the inside, which in this case is currently nothing, and the same as whatever's on the outside, which is 4. So I'm going to start my graph at 0, 4. Now here's where it gets tricky. This is where you need to consider your table. And if you remember when I mentioned up top, you have to be very careful with what you pick, what numbers you pick. Because I'm dealing with a square root, we want a number that will actually square root. So let's consider 1, like we did up above. So on the up here, this is going to give me, and I'll write it out so you can see it, the square root of 1 plus 4. Well, the square root of 1 is just 1, plus 4 gives me 5. Let's consider if I did 4. That's going to give me the square root of 4 plus 4, which means this becomes a 2 plus 4, gives me 6. And the next one, let's do 9 because that's another perfect square. We're going to do the square root of 9 plus 4. That means I get 3 plus 4, gives me 7. Now again, if you're wondering to yourself, where did I pick those numbers? Where did 1, 4, and 9 come from? It's because I know that I'm dealing with a square root, so I want perfect squares so that when I plug them in, it will work out to be a whole number. If I try to plug in a 2 right now, that's totally fine. You're going to get the square root of 2, which is going to be a little ugly, and it's going to be a decimal. And then you would add 4, just making it a bigger ugly number. So if you can pick perfect squares, you're going to be better off. So let's graph these points now. We're at 1, 5. We're at 4, 6 and we're at 9, 7.
Okay, so there's our graph. And again, consider the fact that we don't go into the negative numbers because that would make us imaginary numbers. Now we look at the next one. We're going to do the same thing. Start with your vertex. Opposite of what's inside, same as what's outside. Now, once you get the hang of this, you can pick it up a little bit more because we can quickly identify the vertex is at 0, negative 3. And then we could go to our table. However, before we go to our table, I want you to consider something. I want you to consider, do you recognize any patterns happening here? So go back to your parent graph for a second. And notice that my first point, I went up 1 over 1, then up 1 over 3, then up 1 and over 5. Do you notice any patterns? So let's write this as our slope, rise over run. Up 1 over 1, up 1 over 3, up 1 over 5. So you could predict our next one would be up 1 over 7, up 1 over 9. So you start noticing that it's always going to be up 1, but over by an odd number, and that odd number is constantly changing. We check to see if this is true. Up 1 over 1, up 1 over 3, up 1 over 5. And sure enough, it proves true yet again. So this next one, I could kind of test out that theory and say up 1 over 1, up 1 over 3, up 1 over 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Draw in my graph. And afterwards, let's check those three points and make sure they're legitimate. So if I plug in a 1, this is going to give me 1 minus 3 would give me a negative 2. Sure enough, I'm at negative 2. Let's try this one when x is 4. I plug in a 4, square root it gives me 2, minus 3 gives me negative 1. Sure enough, I'm at negative 1. And I test out the last one, which is when x is 9. Square root of 9 is 3, minus 3 gives me 0, and yet again, it's true. This pattern of having this up 1 over 1, up 1 over 3, up 1 over 5, up 1 over 7 is always true when there is no A value. Because again, that A value affects our shape. So if there's no A value, you can follow this pattern. Okay? And I just want to stress that because if an A value was thrown in there, it's going to affect the shape. Now, if we go on to the next problem, okay, this time it looks very similar, but this time my numbers or my vertex is going to be affected on the inside. So I'm going to have my teal and my navy blue again, again, just so we can kind of tell the difference between the two graphs, especially since these are your notes. So I look at this one and I say, what's my vertex going to be? So it's always the opposite of what's inside, so it must be a negative 5. And the same as whatever's on the outside, which in this case is nothing, so we get negative 5 comma 0. I could do the same thing for this one, say opposite of what's inside, we'll make that a positive 2. And the same as what's outside, which in this case is nothing. So now we have our two vertexes, and if we want to graph those, we can. Um, I recommend maybe only doing one at a time. I'm just kind of showing you where those two vertexes are, mainly because people try to connect the dots then, and these are two completely unrelated graphs. On a quiz or a test, you'd only see one at a time, or maybe you'd see this one at a time, but you'd only be doing one graph on here, okay? It's just to save space, I figured I would just put two on there. So let's focus on this one right here. Now, could we do the table and plug in some points? Yes, 100%, go for it. But here's where you run into the issues, is if you try the exact same numbers that we did last time, they might not always work out to be perfect squares. Let's say that I plug in the number 4, because 4 was one we used on the previous page. Well, 4 plus 5 gives me 9, which does work out to be a perfect square, and therefore the square root of 9 is 3. So sometimes you can get lucky and pick out one, but it won't always work out that way. So you have to be very careful. Let me try one more. Here's a perfect square, 9. I plug in a 9, that gives me the square root of 14, which is actually not a perfect square, and therefore mm, probably don't want to use it. Okay, So let's use that pattern we learned on the front and see if it's helpful here.
So we're going to do up 1 over 1, up 1 over 3, up 1 over 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So right now, my shape is going like this. So we could check some of these points and see if they're true. Well, the first one I notice over here, 4, we already calculated, is at 3. So, so far with that point, we're good. And we could check some of these other ones. Let's say negative 1. If I plug in a negative 1 plus 5 will give me the square root of positive 4, which is in fact 2. So sure enough, that pattern holds true yet again. So I would recommend if you could learn this pattern, it's going to make graphing a lot easier. If you're not a fan of the pattern, then the table will always work as it did in the other units. But if you can recognize this pattern, it will make your life a lot easier. So on this one, I already have my vertex done. I just have to do that pattern. Up 1 over 1, up 1 over 3, up 1 over 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 would be about there. And now I draw in my curve, and boom, I have my answer. Okay. So pretty much what I wanted to show you on these graphs is the fact that these ones had my shifts inside the radical, and you notice that left and right movement, versus the ones on the previous page had my numbers on the outside, and I had more of an up and down movement. So we go to our very last example for the day, and this is kind of an all-inclusive type of problem. So we not only have a number on the inside, but we have a number on the outside. So I'm going to go ahead and say, what's my vertex? Opposite of what's inside, same as what's outside. Okay, I'm going to go to the point negative 2 comma 4. Now if you have to go to the table, you can go to the table. Maybe even pause this video, do the table, however you want to do it. However, if you're comfortable with that pattern, we can go ahead right into graphing, which is up 1 over 1, up 1 over 3, 1, 2, 3. Up 1 over 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and look at that. I already have my graph done. So those of you that would be doing the table would definitely not be done at this point, but those of you that know the pattern, you're done. If you want to check it, I would just go into your table and say, okay, I have a dot at negative 1. If I plug in a negative 1, does that in fact give me 5? Negative 1 plus 2 gives me 1. Square root of 1 is 1. Plus 4 does give me 5. You could check it again with 2. Plug in a 2. 2 plus 2 is 4. Square root, it gives me 2. 2 plus 4 gives me 6, and I'm good. So you could always go back and check those later, uh, but that's basically how we go about it there. Now, the very last thing is something to think about. Think about the domain and range for this. We've talked about domain and range before. And if you remember, domain was our x, range was our y. So what does that mean to you guys? You want to consider what are all the possible x values that you can plug into this graph. This is going to be crucial for square roots. Because if we look at the x values that we used, notice how we didn't go over here to negative 3, or over to negative 4, or negative 5. We didn't use these numbers. Why did we not use these numbers? Because if you remember up above here, we said that if we use those negative numbers, we're going to get negative square roots. So if I go on this side of the graph, I'm going to get imaginary numbers. Therefore, when I'm picking x's, I do not want them to be down here. They have to be part of this arch. So that means that my x values are going to be bigger than greater than or exactly equal to negative 2. Now this may alarm some of you because you're like, well, it can't be a negative number. It can't result in a negative number, but it can actually be a negative number. Because if I plug in a negative 2 here, plus 2 gives me 0. Now I no longer have a negative 2 under my square root. Or if I plug in a negative 1 plus 2, that's going to give me the square root of positive 1, which is totally fine. We go back up here. This graph is a lot in the negative numbers. It's okay to be in the negative numbers. We just can't go on that side of our graph. That side of our graph is imaginary numbers. This side of our graph is okay. So it's okay to be in the negative x range. 
it's just the product, or not product, but the sum inside that square root cannot be negative. Then we consider our range, and we notice the same thing happening on our range, is that we don't really look at any y values that are down here. My graph is starting here and pretty much just going up forever and ever from that point. It never really goes back down. Therefore, my range, talking about my y values, is going to be greater than or equal to kind of where my graph starts, which is at 4. Okay. Now, the last thing, and I know I said the domain and range was our last thing, but this last one is something for food for thought. And when you do your homework tonight, you might actually discover this in your homework. But it says, what difference would it make if there was a negative sign out front of our square root? So, with the remainder of my five minutes that I would like to take up, I want you to go back to this problem we had, x plus 2 plus 4, and we're going to throw a negative sign out in front. So, our vertex doesn't change, negative 2 comma 4, so I'm still going to be right there at my vertex. But let's see what happens when I plug in the values that I used before. Let's say that I plug in a uh, x, y, let's plug in the negative 1, because negative 1 worked last time. Let's see what my negative 1 goes. Negative 1 plus 2 gives me 1. Make it negative means I have a negative 1 plus 4 gives me positive 3. Okay, interesting result. Let's try our next one. We did 2. Let's plug in 2. 2 plus 2 gives me 4. The square root of 4 gives me 2. Make that 2 negative. Negative 2 plus 4 gives me positive 2. So let's graph these. We're at negative 1 comma 3. We're at 2 comma 2. And we could even keep going if we wanted to calculate. Uh, before we did 7, we could calculate 7. But I want you to pause and check this out. This time I went down 1 over 1, down 1 over 3. So it's safe to say our next one would be down 1 over 5 or down 1 over 7 and so forth and so on. So notice that that negative number actually just causes our graph to rather than be going up into the positive numbers, now it's going down into like decreasing. So actually that's what that negative symbol out in front would do to a graph. Without it, as long as that you know, number out in front is positive, out here it's positive, it's positive here, as long as the whole square root is positive, your graph will be positive. But if I have a negative out in front of my square root, that's going to make my graph go down and be more of a negative decreasing graph. Okay, any of these, I mean, I could go back to some of these we did on the front page. If I put a negative sign out in front, it's going to make my graph kind of go that downward arch. If I put a negative out in front of this graph, it's going to take that downward arch look. Okay, now you'll never have both. It's one or the other. You're either going up because it's positive or you're going down because it's negative. So you're never going to really have both. Our graphs right now have both because I kind of did them on the same graph, but I just want to point that out, that they're not always going to be together. Never would we see them together. It's either one, it's either going down, or it's going up, but it's never going to be both. So just keep an eye on that. So your homework tonight is from the book. So that book assignment, um, you can either use the book or you can find the book or in OneNote. But you will need graph paper, so I would recommend grabbing some graph paper maybe in class or having graph paper of some sort somewhere. Um, but otherwise, you are going to have to graph some of these problems. You're also going to have to do some domain and range assessments and say what's the domain and range for those. Okay, So just remember with domain and range, kind of consider where you started and where you're going. Are you going greater than or less than? We're never going to be going less than. That would be bad. And then as far as the Ys, are you going up or are you going down depending on the graph?